Hey everyone, um, my name is Sasha Rush. I'm a professor at Cornell Tech, um, but actually I um, spend a lot of my time writing PyTorch open source code. Um, I've contributed to OpenNMT, an open source neural machine translation toolkit, um, the annotated transformer, which is a description of the intricacies of the transformer model, um, tensor considered harmful, which was a polemic to try to convince PyTorch to add named tensors, and um, Glitter, or the giant language model test room, which lets you play and explore with large-scale language models and try to determine whether text was generated by a human or by a computer. So today I want to talk a little bit about some of the topics we've been thinking about in my research group recently. We're a research group focused in natural language processing and machine learning. And the results in natural language processing recently have been really cool we're suddenly able to solve a lot of problems that I never really thought would be possible to solve. And a lot of the reason we're able to do that is by these giant pre-trained black box models. Um, and if you're a user using one of these models, you can take some input, pass it through this black box, and almost automatically get state-of-the-art results on most tasks. Um, but really, that's the main mode of interaction with these models. And one thing I've been interested in is trying to understand whether we could do post hoc interpretation of the models themselves. If we're a user, can we build tools to look into the model and understand maybe what decisions it made and why it made them for a given input? And my group has worked um, very closely with experts in visualization to build tools like LSTM Viz to allow you to dive into a model and understand what the different structures of that model were. And while these tools have been, I think, really useful from a pedagogical point of view, they haven't really gotten at the main kind of underlying question of trying to understand what a model is doing. So in recent years, we've been looking at a different paradigm, which is to really think about model inference from the ground up. We want to build models that have these kind of interpretable hooks that you build into the model itself. With the main idea that you have some problem-specific information you would like to understand and work with. And we're envisioning a collaborative process where the end user is working with the model and providing feedback both towards the decision the model makes, but also feedback in a counterfactual way. What would the model have to have predicted to get a different input under a given scenario? And I think to do this, we really need a kind of different style of model that's built from the ground up with these goals of collaboration in mind. So let me give you a very concrete example. One problem I've been very interested in for the last five years or so is the problem of collaborative writing and summarization. We have models now that can kind of generate really fluent nonsense, but what I really want to do is have a model I can work directly with, that I can collaborate with to produce a result. So one data set we've played with is a data set of basketball box scores paired with long-form descriptions of what happened in each game. You can take this data and train some model on it. It will produce some output, and it's pretty good, maybe 80% right. Um, but in practice, 80% right is not that useful. We need to get to high-precision modeling, and we want a model that can interact with a human. Can I, say, maybe talk about something else or express it in a different way? Can I work with how the model uses information in a long-form um, uh, summarization? Um, and can I kind of deal with the internal structures of the model themselves in a way that makes sense to a human user? So concretely, I've been interested in these kind of collaborative first models that have three parts. How can we build models that allow for fine-grained probabilistic control? I like probabilistic models because they're easy for a human user to work with. But I also want all the rich learned features and pre-trained models that have made natural language processing work so well. And of course, all of these things have to be efficient and trained in an end-to-end -end manner. So in some ways, the only reason I'm able to work with this style of model is because of toolkits like PyTorch. Having a toolkit that allows me to have all the kind of mathematical structures I need for developing probabilistic control, to build in my distributions and reparameterization, to build fast dynamic programming, and to use higher order gradients. At the same time, I need all of the pre-trained models and support from having a framework that lets me interact these probabilistic modeling with all the latest developments in autoregressive models, attention, 
pre-trained transformers, and even now kind of dynamic graph structures. On top of this, I want to do the, all this end-to-end -end training on both classes of models. To do this, I need aspects of reinforcement learning, of variational inference, of probabilistic flows. And I need these all to kind of work seamlessly together. So one library I've been working on recently is a library called PyTorch Struct that tries to implement these ideas in practice in a usable way. This is a library designed for those um, in the research community who want to utilize distributions over combinatorial objects. There's a long history in natural language processing about using rich distributions over trees, chains, arborescence, and segmentations. You can think of these as the basic structures of grammar that you may have learned about in grade school. But I want to build this library in a way where it adapts and interacts nicely with pre-trained transformers, with dynamic graphs, and with structured reinforcement learning. And in some sense, I'm going back and looking at the past 20 years of NLP and saying, well, how many lines of PyTorch would that really take to implement? So let me talk about two case studies. And these both get into some of the more technical aspects of this work. A classic problem we teach in a NLP class, either at a grad or an undergrad level, is the question of what is the probability that a given span appears in a tree. This is a simple problem, but it's useful for doing grammatical analyses, and it's a fun algorithm to implement. But it's also a surprisingly difficult algorithm to implement. If you read an NLP textbook, this will be five to 10 pages of, of writing, and it often involves actually very complicated and error-prone dynamic programming. However, there are a lot of kind of nice mathematical tricks that let you avoid that entirely. And in PyTorch, you can do this whole algorithm by taking advantage of second-order gradients. So to do this, we simply write down a dynamic program representing the tree. It takes maybe about five or 10 lines. And then we call torch.grad on this function. When I first did this, I kind of was just doing it as a unit test. But it turns out that writing this code is much, much, much faster than any other kind of custom implementation I would have written in Python. So we can do this for many different structures and get out these probabilities. But there are many other things you need if you want to build a modern reinforcement learning or variational autoencoder algorithm on top of trees. You need to compute the argmax tree. You need to compute entropy. You need to be able to compute samples. All of these structures can be used by just modularizing the algorithm I showed in the previous slide. If we override the meaning of sum and multiplication, the same code before can be used to compute all these quantities. Furthermore, if we give ourselves the ability to override gradients and instead return samples or subgradients, all these calculations can be computed efficiently using the same code. So this library was simply an implementation of these core ideas taking advantage of kind of the more advanced features of PyTorch. And in practice, you can go and build some fun algorithms just by putting these together. So the final example, this is a data set known as ListOps. The goal of the data set is to take a tokenized mathematical expression and try to evaluate that expression using only a neural network. It turns out that if you use an LSTM or a transformer and try to use it to evaluate this expression, it won't get it right a lot of the time. It learns some tree structure, but not the correct one. And it certainly doesn't generalize to longer expressions. So in the literature, the way people have done this is they first try to learn the tree, learn the syntax, and then use that tree structure to compute the output. But to do this, it requires all the operations I described before. To sample a tree, we need to also uh, compute its entropy, uh, compute an argmax, compute its marginals. Um, to compute the deep model, we need a dynamic graph network here, a tree LSTM, using the DGL library. Furthermore, to put this all together, we want run, a, run RL, policy gradient, and we need to use advanced baselines, which often require computing other information about the tree structure. But in practice, we can put these all together in a couple lines of code, and we can produce this structure on the right, where you can see the model trying to learn a discrete tree and then use that tree to produce its output. Here, the red dots represent where it had an incorrect tree, and the white where it was correct. This is the code. Cool. Um, 
So in conclusion, I think learning structure is very useful for doing this sort of collaborative inference. These methods are challenging to implement, but they're getting a lot easier. Finally, PyTorch has been a really nice framework for building these types of tools. But even more so, I think having frameworks that push the boundary of what they allow you to do mathematically actually lets us do more interesting research and do some of the empirical research that produces more interesting models. Okay, thank you very much.